remote code execution essentially allows you to run code on that target system uh, as whoever that application is running on. Therefore, you can then use it to infiltrate other devices, to pivot to other systems in that environment. It's a really serious vulnerability. And uh, I believe the National Vulnerability Database has a score of, of 10.0, which I believe is the, uh, is, is the highest you can go. The only limitation is the creativity of the adversary. Welcome to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast, where we share short and to the point perspectives on the cyber landscape. It's all about engaging yet casual conversations on what organizations are doing to reimagine their cyber programs while ensuring their business objectives are top priority. With my co-host, Stan Wisseman, Head of Security Strategist. I'm Rob Borrego, Chief Security Strategist, and this is Reimagining Cyber. To our regular listeners, um, Rob is out on holidays today, so I'm flying solo. There's some time sensitivity to this episode, so we didn't want to wait and delay it any further. So our guest is Steve Springett. Steve is currently leading software security for ServiceNow and their product security team. Steve has a passion for helping organizations identify and reduce risk from the use of third-party and open source components. He leads the OWASP Dependency Track Project, the OWASP Software Component Verification Standard, and is the creator and chair of the OWASP Cyclone DX Working Group. That's defined a software build material standard. Steve, I can't think of anyone else we'd rather have on our podcast to discuss the Log4j vulnerabilities. But before we delve into all that, I do want to give you an opportunity to say if there's anything else in your background that you'd like to, our listeners to know. Yeah, thanks, Stan. Um, and, and thanks for the invite for, for getting me on. Um, never let a, a crisis like Log4j go to waste. <laughs> right. Um, but no, I think you. I think you covered it good. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge open source uh, advocate and contributor. So um, outside of what what you've already mentioned, I think uh, you can you can find me on GitHub and 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 the Twitter sphere. Great. So you know, vulnerabilities um, in the open source Apache logging library Log4j as as system administrators and security professionals and software vendors scrambling. A lot of folks are worried about whether they're going to be able to take any time off this holiday season, right? Um, the, the flaws in this library are, are exposing some of the, the world's most popular applications and services to attack. Um, Steve, why are the vulnerabilities in Log4j so bad? Well, this particular vulnerability is in a logging uh, library. Um, logging libraries are basically responsible for um, logging events such as such and such user logged in at X time, for example, mm -hmm. uh, logging those um, events, usually to a file. Um, and most systems, at least most Java systems, um, use some kind of logging framework uh, or logging library and log4j being a, a very, very popular choice uh, among uh, Java programmers. Uh, due to Java's um, very enterprise uh, approach. Uh, a lot of large enterprises uh, have large Java environments. Um, this vulnerability was pretty much everywhere. Um, also, given the fact that Java was uh, maybe not so much anymore, but was once billed as, as write once, run anywhere, um, Java is also in a lot of embedded devices as well. So the the extent that this vulnerability has, it there's just so many millions of, of devices and applications that are potentially impacted by this one vulnerability. And, and why is it so easy for attackers to be able to exploit it? Yeah, no, that's that's good because the logging functionality in many cases is just a pass through. Um, you know, such and such user logged in at such and such time. And malicious actors can craft that kind of uh, response, and instead of that, instead of that normal use case uh, for you know logging in, if you have control over what's being logged, for example, the username, for example, uh, you can then craft specific payloads that would then give you remote code execution uh, or RCE, and remote code execution essentially 
allows you to run code on that target system uh, as whoever user that system is uh, that application is running on. So therefore, you can then use it as a um, you know to infiltrate other devices, to pivot to other systems in that environment. It's a it's a really serious vulnerability, and uh, I believe the National Vulnerability Database has a score of of 10.0, which I believe is the uh, is is the highest you can go. You're right. You're right. And so, the threat actor can execute pretty much any string, and it's also difficult to then know what they're going to do, right? Because they could potentially take your AWS, you know, secret key. They could you know, download ransomware, they could do a variety of things, right? Yes, they could. Um, the only limitation is the creativity of the adversary. Um, but yeah, anything would be essentially possible uh, with the remote code execution vulnerability. And so that was the first vulnerability that was discovered. And then they did a proof of concept. They posted to GitHub. The Subsequently, they found other vulnerabilities, like one that can um, do a denial of service through um, uncontrolled recursion bugs, right? You know, so so if if you're looking at the the scope of the vulnerabilities found to date, are they are are they different mitigation approaches that have to be taken? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. The you know, one approach to fix it from the log for J team, uh, I believe they put some regular expressions as you were kind of alluding to um, in some of their validate in some of their validation. And uh, regular expressions uh, can be vulnerable depending on how you write them. Uh, there's a, a well-known attack called Redos or regular expression denial of service, which is essentially what this this um, mitigation to the original RCE vulnerability. Um, introduced. So it, it, they fixed one vulnerability and, and introduced a, a different vulnerability. Um, in my opinion, the, the, I'm not, I, I didn't look at the ratings on the, on the Redos vulnerability, but the RCE vulnerability is, is definitely the more serious of the two, but still having a, a denial of service vulnerability against a, um, a library that uh, an adversary could potentially control the payload to um, is certainly troublesome. Um, so the mitigating controls for, for both of these things are, are different. Um, and I don't think it was until version 2.17, I think, that uh, both of those issues were um, completely resolved. Yeah, I think 2.16, we know of. 2 .16, right, addressed that first vulnerability, right? And I think 2.17 right. is what actually addresses both, right? And so right. the recommendation then is to actually patch to that latest version. Yes, exactly. 217 or, or higher would be the, uh, the recommended uh, upgrade path. Um, now, this, is, uh, this also brings up an interesting point um, in, that, in, in the fact that this affects a specific module for Log4j. Log4j has a lot of different modules. Uh, modern software is um, it is composed of, of many different modules, um, and each module having a, a certain type of functionality. Uh, one of the things that I did see over the last week were applications that only had a dependency on Log4j API, for example, needlessly upgrading. Well, the API wasn't vulnerable. It the API basically defines. Um, the how you would programmatically interact with log4j. It actually doesn't include the core logging functionality. That functionality is available in a different library called log4j core. And if you were using log4j core, then you were absolutely vulnerable. Um, but the organizations that were not using log4j core um, did not necessarily have to upgrade. Gotcha. Do you, you mentioned that you know modern applications have all these components like as, as part of that challenge, right? They're, they're, nowadays, modern apps are assembled from dozens, if not hundreds of components. Uh, and and you know, we, we do that, right? Because we pretty much agree that there's no point in reinventing basic plumbing, <laughs> uh, you know, that all software needs. And, and so why reinvent the wheel every time? But 
during an incident like this, um, what's that process an organization goes through to determine exposure? And to your point, you know, the fact that do you really want to waste cycles if you're, uh, you don't want to waste cycles if you don't have to. And, and, and you know, that the, the point of core versus API is an example of that. They're, they're, they're wasting cycles having to do this upgrade where they didn't necessarily have to. Yeah, I mean, right now, unless um, unl unless you really know what applications are are in your environment, which unfortunately a lot of a, a lot of organizations still don't have a complete inventory of um, of all first party and third party applications, but you really need that that full inventory of what do you have, and then based on on what you have, what language does it use? Um, because then that will allow you to, to filter out um, Java, for example, which mm -hmm. Log4j is, is a Java library. So you'd really have to have a system capable of, of describing that full asset inventory, um, being able to identify which, which, which systems, uh, which applications actually use Log4j, and um, really contact the vendors, uh, whether it's going to their website, calling up their support, uh, whatever the case is, just to see if they are, are potentially impacted by the uh, this particular vulnerability and, and future vulnerabilities for that matter. So having a comprehensive asset management and having the details you need to be able to make those kind of decisions. Um, and, and, and in a related note, you know, you've been a great advocate for uh, open source software risk management. And you, as I mentioned before, you, you, you've um, been pushing hard for um, getting that transparency, right? And as far as the, what's being used in the environment. And so one of the, the um, acronyms out there is SCA, Software Composition Analysis. Can, can you explain how SCA can, can help mitigate open source software risks? Yeah, so SCA is, is, is Software Composition Analysis and SCA is, is essentially a way to um, either through manifest analysis, looking at uh, the build time um, artifacts like a palm.xml or uh, package lock.json, uh, looking at those type of manifest, or in some cases, looking at the binaries themselves and trying to determine whether, trying to determine what something is or what something includes. Uh, for example, uh, I might run a SCA tool against my source repo or against a, a binary that I've um, that I've created and um, with the intent of being able to analyze it with an SCA tool and discover whether or not I have log4j or any other type of, of vulnerable component. Uh, SCA typically does three sorts of things. Um, they typically look for, for known vulnerabilities. So these mm -hmm. are things like the log4j vuln. Uh, they typically look for things that are out of date, right? Um, you know, log4j1, I think, was, uh, you know, out of support six years ago, I think it was. But may not have been um, vulnerable either, so <laughs> that's kind exactly, of ironic. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Struts1 come to, comes to mind, too. <laughs> Another famous Apache project. But, um, but yeah, they'll typically tell you whether or not uh, something is out of date or not. And um, also along those lines, they'll also tell you if, if there's any license risk with that particular component as well and you know different sca products have different uh, capabilities but those are the three most uh, prevalent capabilities that are pretty consistent across all sca vendors and one of the things you've been associated with and help chair and lead is the cyclone dx working group in my wasp um, and and part of that effort is is you know that that's key effort is creating a standard around software bill of materials or s bombs and you know, it, it, it's it's becoming more and more frequent that we hear that acronym S bombs and the and the potential value of them. But there's some controversy there too. There's there's some concerns, especially from proprietary vendors, about oh, do I really want to share, you know, what my 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 product is consists of? But uh, can you explain what an S bomb is and why you think it's important? Sure. At a very foundational level, uh, a software bill of material is, is essentially an inventory. It is a list of ingredients of, of what you have in a given product or service. Um, if I am shipping a, an IoT toaster or if I am shipping a, a web app 
right? What is the software stack that's in play uh, for that particular application or device? Um, and that allows, well, one, it, it provides a level of transparency. Um, the adversaries already know what's in your stuff, right? They're, they're, they're uh, using automated tools. They're finding a lot of this stuff out um, just through random, you know, luck. Uh, but the adversaries kind of already know what's, what's in our stuff. Um, but in order for us to better protect what we have, we first need to know you know, what is, uh, what's potentially affected, right? Given that analogy of, of having a list of applications, um, in your environment and broken down, for example, by language, if I actually had a, a software bill of materials for, for these, for these applications, I wouldn't have to call the vendors, right? I would, I would actually know what applications are potentially affected by, by this log for J vulnerability. And that would allow me to focus my, my impact analysis efforts uh, much more um, with, with with finer granularity, right? So I don't have to spend a lot of cycles going to every vendor saying, "Hey, are you vulnerable? Hey, are you vulnerable?" Um, you can do that, but if you if you only have in this particular case, this was a 10.0. This was a remote code execution, and the um, the exploit code was was available almost immediately. So organizations really had hours to, to respond, uh, at least, you know, with any criticality. So the sooner you can get to that kind of impact uh, response, the sooner you can protect your assets. And that's really what software bill of materials is designed for, giving you the full transparency of, of all the inventory that you have in, in an application so that you can better protect it. And Cyclone DX and, um, you know, the, the, the number of SCA vendors out there today can do S bonds for like open source software. But I think what you're advocating is that we also need proprietary vendors to also publish S bonds. So, you know, cons consumers can act more efficiently, but is having an S bomb sufficient or do you uh, in that instant response need to have more? Do you need to have some kind of automated way of responding? You do need more. Um, SBOM is a really good start, right? Uh, but the world doesn't revolve around just software. I mean, you you also mm -hmm. have services, right? I, I can't remember the last time I I operated a piece of software that didn't communicate with the outside world, right? Everything doesn't update or ping some kind of web service on the internet. Um, the software is part of the equation, but services are another part. And if you have that IoT toaster, guess what? You know, those hardware components, those Bluetooth components, everything else is kind of relevant. Um, so Cyclone DX uh, does take a full stack approach to its bill of material um, capabilities. Uh, but even with a full stack approach, you kind of need more. Um, because even if you did have all the inventory information, um, you still don't know whether or not each one of these ap applications that use Log4j, for example, it's actually affected, right? Not everything is going to be impacted by this. Just because you're using a library doesn't actually mean that you're vulnerable to that library. Now, given Log4j and its prevalence and uh, and whatnot, I, I have no doubt that a large number of applications are going to be uh, definitely vulnerable to this, but not every application will be. And there's a concept called VEX or vulnerability uh, what's the acronym stand for vulnerability exploitability exchange I think and it's a way for that's vendors right. That's right right yeah <laughs> it's a way for vendors to uh to communicate the exploitability of some of these vulnerabilities some of these vulnerable components because again not everything is going to necessarily be vulnerable uh, as a consumer of software i want to know what i should care about and mm -hmm. if the vendors can supply both an s bomb as well as a vex um, that would be an ideal world. So something that's perhaps at a, another level, um, even above what we're talking about is the efforts you've been working on as far as a software component verification standard. Can you put that in context and how that can be used effectively? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this, this entire year we've, um, we've been talking about supply chain. Uh, if we haven't been talking about COVID, we've been talking about supply chain. And, <laughs> well, uh, solar winds helped kick that off, right? Yes, thank you very yes, much, they solar did. winds. 
<laughs> yes, we were off to a good start. And um, so we've been talking about this for a very long time. Um, I myself have been practicing supply chain security since about 2008 or so, and it's really, really hard. Um, so one thing with all of the, the recent events over the last couple of years, myself and a few others in OWASP and, uh, and some other organizations, we actually came together and created the OWASP Software Component Verification Standard. And SCVS um, is a way to measure and improve an organization's software supply chain insurance. Essentially, what that means is that are you building, are you producing what you think you're producing? And in most cases, for most organizations, it's going to be no, right? Mm. If you're using build systems, if you're using uh, build tools and SDKs and everything with their default configurations, what you are, what you think you're producing um, is not necessarily what you are getting. And SCVS is a way to um, measure and improve that. And like all OWASP standards uh, like this, all verification standards, it's divided into a bunch of domains. I think there's six domains in SCVS. SBOM is one of them. It's a foundational requirement, right? SBOM, beyond just transparency and, 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 and impact analysis, it's just a good engineering practice, right? Knowing what you have is a good engineering practice. Um, so there's an entire domain dedicated in SCVS just for SBOM. And like all OWASP verification standards, there's, there's three levels. Level one, I know how to spell security. Level two, I actually care about security. Level three, oh my gosh, this thing is, you know, national security, public safety. I have to be secure. Um, most organizations should obviously strive for probably level two, right? Um, if they really care. Um, but supply chain security is hard, right? It's not one of these things where you can just go to a single development team and say, hey, fix this vulnerability, fix this uh, threat that we've identified in your design. It's, it's much, much bigger than that. And because it does affect the tools that we use, the partners we choose, the vendors we choose. So it's, uh, it's a much more holistic approach and SCVS takes into consideration your, your build environment, how you package things, pedigree and provenance of, of components. It's a very holistic view of the world. Um, and I would encourage every organization to at least uh, read it, uh, recognize that supply chain security is, um, is something they should, they should definitely start looking at and improving in 2022 and seeing what parts of SCVS that they can actually get started with. Um, I would invite everyone to, I'll just do a quick plug, owas.org slash SCVS. Because we know that there's gonna be another shell shock. There's gonna be another log4j. And so if you can put in place controls that will help you mitigate through process improvement, and this can give you the, the sort of like the the, the steps to take and, and you can pick your maturity level that you need, right? Level one, two, or three. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not one of these things where it's, it's, it's very black and white, right? There's a lot of different requirements. I think there's around 70 or 80 different requirements in SCVS. Um, and focusing, for example, on one domain at a time, maybe, maybe, maybe you want to focus on inventory or you want to focus on S bomb, or you want to focus on build environments, right? I would, I would recommend that you choose one and figure out what level you want to be with and, and come up with a roadmap for how you're going to mature to get to that particular level. Now you mentioned solar winds, which is also interesting. Um, solar winds was, um, was an interesting attack because it, it did actually monitor the build system while it was building. And there are controls in SCVS that actually account for that kind of situation. It's difficult, mind you, but it can be done. And if you do take a holistic approach, uh, you can at least prevent yourselves from being the, the next solar winds. Steve, thanks for helping us better understand the Log4j vulnerability and, and the processes necessary to mitigate this and open source software risks more generally. Again, I couldn't think of anybody else who could have explained it any better. Thanks again. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to have us cover a specific topic of interest, feel free to reach out to us and you can find out how in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe. This podcast was brought to you by CyberRes, a micro-focused line of business, where our mission is to deliver cyber resilience by engaging people, process, and technology to protect, detect, and evolve.